Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Myanmar Economic Forum and the Asian Economic Forum, a very warm welcome to all of you. We hope this evening's discussion on the topic of economic engagement with Myanmar, the road ahead, lays the foundation of an, on a new direction of engaging with Myanmar and also helps provide a path in empowering its next generation young leaders in politics, business, and banking. We are fortunate to have with us three exceptional next generation leaders from Myanmar who bring to us their individual experiences of working and living in Myanmar. We look forward to hearing their thoughts and ideas on why and how we should be engaging with Myanmar, especially during these challenging times. To each of them and their leadership of thought, we are foremost grateful. Thank you, ladies. Next, we also Extremely grateful to Jonathan Head, a gentleman and an institution here at the FCCT and within the larger uh, media community in Bangkok and Southeast Asia, who will be moderating this discussion. Thank you, Jonathan. As we now look forward to an engaging evening, I would also like to take a moment to introduce ourselves, i.e. the Myanmar Economic Forum, which is a economic-focused public policy think tank. Our journey to becoming a think tank really started off in 2015. Back then, much of the world was excited about the emergence of Myanmar as the last frontier market for investor considerations. And we held our first conference focused on that same theme in Yangon in October 2015. A short time thereafter, in, in thereabouts of November, 2015, just after the elections, we were requested to help, help out in capacity building exercises and therein started our journey to becoming a think tank. We started focusing on multi-stakeholder discussions and our focus originally was how to help Myanmar get a sovereign rating and thereafter guide them on financial sector and monetary policy discussion conversations. However, moving forward with the passage of time, Myanmar today is beset with many challenges. The lack of any real economic vision or policy leadership over the years has also been unfortunately compounded and overshadowed by the horrific developments of August 2017 in Rakhine. These developments, however, have not prevented us from convening conversations on difficult but important topics be it on the economic cost of Rakhine or on anti-money laundering compliance related issues. However, as a think tank, we also have our limitations. We are not a substitute for political conversations, nor can we help government to government conversations on matters related to political solutions or a national healing process. Nevertheless, from time to time, when we see an opportunity to convene discussions to help us engage multi-stakeholders with economic policy touch points, we, as this evening suggests, we do try and move the ball forward. The objective over here is to create an environment that is solution-centric and strives towards a fairer economic path forward. Next, uh, let me also thank members of the press and the FCCT leadership who play an important role in bringing so many important stories and discussions to the global audience. We read your work and stories and we hear your voices and we owe you our gratitude. So thank you for coming. Finally, let me now uh, welcome one voice of common reason whose intellectual support over the last few years since his arrival in Yangon has made us at the Myanmar Economic Forum a more meaningful platform for dialogue for both local and global stakeholders. Uh, please join me in welcoming my good friend John Fleming, a senior commercial officer and first secretary at the US Embassy in Yangon to provide us with an independent con a country assessment for Myanmar. John. Yeah, good evening. Let me say it's uh, truly an honor to be here at the FCC in Thailand. Uh, if you'll indulge in uh, just a quick personal anecdote, I actually uh, would like to offer a, a belated thank you to uh, FCCT. And uh, let me take you back to 1993. 
I was uh, working for a French NGO in Phnom Penh. And in those days, uh, you know, Phnom Penh had uh, no traffic lights, no shopping malls, uh, decent restaurants for expats you couldn't count on one hand. There were no movie theaters. And so in that environment, I had two guilty pleasures. One was to go swimming at the International Youth Club. And uh, sadly, <laughs> sad to say, the, um, that, that place no longer exists. Uh, in fact, the very large U.S. Embassy was built right on top of that, uh, that property. The second guilty pleasure I always had was movie night. And movie night was every Saturday at the FCC of Cambodia. And the beauty of movie night was you just showed up with friends for food and drinks, and you never knew what movie it would be because back in those days, it was FCC Thailand that would ship once a week a laser disc. I mean, this is 1993, a laser disc of, of a movie that they would show on Saturday nights in uh, FCC uh, Cambodia. So just wanted to say thank you for uh, you know, improving life for the NGO community in Cambodia back in 1993. But enough about Cambodia. Uh, today, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, Myanmar, uh, more specifically, economic engagement uh, in Myanmar. And uh, as Dinesh mentioned, I'm uh, the senior commercial officer at the US Embassy in Yangon. And uh, our position at the US mission is the best way forward for Myanmar is through economic engagement. Uh, my role in that as a commercial officer is to showcase uh, opportunities for US companies in the market. And um, as you can imagine, it's been, it's been challenging over the past year and a half. Uh, a real challenge is, is uh, the uh, ease of doing business. I think most of you are familiar with the World Bank uh, Index. Myanmar uh, ranks at 171 on, on this ease of doing business index. So it's quite challenging. Um, the strategy, however, has been, let me put it this way. I think probably most of you know the, uh, the American idiom that says you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And um, in this situation, U.S. companies were not being led into Myanmar. They were staying away. So the strategy is, has been, if I can mangle that, that idiom a bit, is to carry the water to the horses, the U.S. companies, in nearby stables, meaning in the, in the region, in ASEAN. Uh, Myanmar companies are very willing to travel to meet with U.S. companies. So we've taken delegations from Myanmar uh, to uh, trade shows in Dubai, in Singapore, here in Bangkok, and even the United States. Uh, just one example, uh, the one, one, one thing we do at the commercial service is we also promote the U.S. as an investment destination. And once a year there's an annual summit, a U.S. investment summit in Washington. And we decided to bring this message to Myanmar and build the delegation to take to Washington for the summit. And when we reported that to Washington, we were told, okay, your quota for the delegation is two. Bring two delegates to the summit. Well, we spread the word, and we, last year we brought 13 delegates to the summit. This year, our, our quota is 10, and we have at least 20 ready to sign up. So the point is, uh, we can, if, if, if the horse is not coming to the water, we can bring the water to the horses, and we're gonna make those connections. The next thing we got, have to do is actually get the U.S. companies to, to come in. So uh, what we decided to do is build a trade mission, uh, and we're targeting new to market companies to look at, look at explore, explore Myanmar and uh, join us in Yangon. And there, uh, again, the strategy has been to uh, focus on U.S. companies already in Asia. We don't expect companies uh, to travel all the way to the United States to come to Myanmar, but we've, uh, we've traveled to uh, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, and in fact, that's why I'm in uh, Bangkok today, just this morning. Uh, I, uh, we, we had a briefing about Myanmar uh, to Amsham, Thailand. So we're hopeful that we can bring uh, some new companies, some, um, uh, you know, uh, new blood to the market. We want new to market companies to have a look. So moving forward, this is what we're going to do. We're going to continue to engage. We are going to connect Myanmar companies to U.S. businesses, and we're going to try to 
counsel U.S. companies to come into the market. Um, let me, let me uh, conclude with just one image for you. Um, I've been with the Department of Commerce uh, since 2000, and um, I don't know if you're familiar with the U.S. Department uh, emblem, uh, U.S. Department of Commerce emblem, but uh, it features uh, three components. Honestly, I never paid you know much attention to it until recently, but there's three components. <clears throat> there's a there's an American Eagle, there's a three-masted schooner sailing through high seas, and there's a lighthouse beacon beaming. And I find it's, this imagery is actually pretty apt for the Myanmar market. So the U.S. companies, the schooner, is navigating these challenging markets, the high seas, and the U.S. government will engage and serve as a, serve as a lighthouse to assist the companies and help them navigate the markets and engage uh, in Myanmar. So on that note, I will turn it over to our distinguished panel to hear more about Myanmar, and I thank you for your interest, and thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you very much. Okay, um, let's uh, get the meat of the discussion going. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Dinesh, and thank you, John, as well. Um, my brief as a correspondent for the BBC is to cover Southeast Asia, and I've been going in and out of Myanmar since uh, 2001, when I was first based here. So inevitably, I've been able to see the astonishing changes that uh, took place. I was actually based in Istanbul when they first started opening up in 2011, after the 2010 election, came back here in 2012, and was able to go into Myanmar and see for myself just how things were changing, and it was astonishing. And of course, it was very exciting. Um, and we were all gripped by um, the potential of Myanmar, this, this huge country in such a strategic location, a large population that had been held in isolation and held down for so long, everybody was excited about it. Even back then, uh, when you actually went in and talked to businesses who were coming in from outside, people bringing in um, exploratory missions, the realities of the challenges were, were formidable. Uh, it was obvious the infrastructure was very poor, uh, there was very little experience in doing business. It, it, you were starting from such a different level compared to neighboring countries. Um, there were what people call the um, low-hanging fruit, the easy pickings of the kinds of businesses you can make quick money on, like telecoms and tourism. Um, the extractive industries, of course, Myanmar is full of uh, raw resor natural resources. Um, but doing anything more than that was quite obviously going to be a very big challenge. Um, I don't get into Myanmar as much now. The BBC has a bureau there, and I've got a, a very capable colleague who keeps us fully abreast of, of developments. But I, I, of course, did get pulled back in um, when we had those, that violence in Rakhine State and the mass exodus of Rohingya Muslims, which has had a huge impact, of course, on the country's reputation. Now, whether that really affects investment in business, I think, is a different matter. I know that for some businesses, there is serious concern about image, reputational risk. Um, the reality of Rakhine State is it's an isolated state with enormous problems. And in fact, the conflict there has evolved in a quite dramatic way this year with um, serious fighting now between the Myanmar armed forces and Rakhine Buddhist militants in the Arakan army. Uh, it's a very complex conflict. Um, it's very hard to get to Rakhine State unless you fly there. There are very few road routes. And, and to be honest, it is so isolated. I think when you're looking at Myanmar and its economic potential, you have to look at the rest of the country and its population and address those economic issues with some degree of separation. Um, so, you know, I think there's no question given its position. The country needs investment. There are lots of opportunities. The people of Myanmar need opportunities. Um, I was reporting in the days when sanctions were in place against Myanmar, and after a while it became pretty clear to us as reporters that sanctions were counterproductive, um, that they, you know, they, they generally didn't affect the people who were in power. Um, they had some effect because they probably had some ro role in persuading the military government to open up. Uh, there's been some talk of reapplying sanctions. Uh, I think that's very unlikely and not very realistic. Economic engagement is still there. Um, it will come either f from whichever countries want to do it, and clearly a lot of countries in the region want to engage. Obviously, there will be concerns about what's happened in Rakhine State uh, and what's been the treatment of the Rohingya people, and for many businesses, that will be a factor, and that's a reality. 
Uh, I'm very pleased to be part of this panel. I mean, most of my reporting tends to be on the more negative sides, the dramatic things that happen. Uh, and I, I'm always very aware when I'm doing it that, you know, we do need to draw attention to what are less glamorous, the economic stories, but they are the, the lifeblood of a country. Um, and it's very good to have this opportunity to look at the challenges and take stock of how well Myanmar is doing now in 2019. I'm also very pleased that we've got an all-women panel. We don't often pull that off at the Foreign Correspondents Club. Um, and on some subject like this, this is absolutely fantastic. We have a, um, somebody in the corporate sector, um, a politician, and someone in the banking sector, which is a perfect balance. Um, immediately to my right is uh, Dr. Sone Niu, who uh, is a pioneer in pharmaceuticals in Myanmar um, and is now um, working with the Pacific AA Group, one of the bigger pharmaceutical groups um, manufacturing and distributing pharmaceuticals in Myanmar. She's also involved in auto distribution, so she's got a very good handle on the challenges for the corporate sector. Um, in the center is uh, uh, Dr. Tet Tet Kain. Anybody who's been involved in Myanmar will know her as one of the most active women entrepreneurs in Myanmar for a very long time. Um, her business is Golden Palace Golden Jewelry, but of course she's now also a uh, member of parliament for the National League for Democracy and um, active on the um, uh, Banks and Monetary Affairs uh, Development Committee in the parliament, so playing a very important role in establishing a healthy financial um, foundation for the country. And then to her right is uh, Chao Kei Kang, who's working for the um, United Amara Bank. It's one of the first private banks to open in Myanmar, and banking is a absolutely critical sector. It's, it's, it, again, for journalists, it's not very, very necessarily a very glamorous sector, um, but access to credit and financing has been one of the biggest challenges for Myanmar, for entrepreneurs in Myanmar, trying to develop while at the same time facing um, foreign competition as the country opens up. Uh, and I don't think, um, Kay, you would be in dispute that the banking sector still got a long way to go. Um, there literally wasn't really any banking to speak of as we recognize it before the opening in 2012. I'd like to start with, um, Tet Tet Kain, uh, Tet because you know, you're in politics, you have a, a, a finger on the pulse of government, and a great deal about Myanmar's potential is being dictated by government policy. I know you've got a, a small prepared speech, so perhaps mm -hmm. you could set the tone for this discussion with that. Okay, thank you. And, and good evening, everybody. Uh, let me extend my sincere thanks to Myanmar Economic Forum and FCCT for arranging this meaningful interaction with the international media and members of international community. Tonight here at the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand, I have been going through some self-reflection on Myanmar's potentials and challenges and wish th to share the same with all of you this evening. Myanmar is yet very young in its nascent progress to being a democratic country. However, we are very grateful to those who took the bold moves of multidimensional reforms starting from 2011 after half a century of self-segregation. My complex and uh, many complex and legacy narratives of history, culture, domestic circumstances of Myanmar constantly shape our country's development passage. And I do believe that we can learn the lessons from the experiences of other successful countries that have been ahead of our development and reconciliation trajectory. With regional integration within ASEAN and the rise of Asia as a new global growth center, this changing panorama has significant influences for economic dynamics of Myanmar. In order to maintain the growth momentum, we need balanced and forward-looking leadership that will improve the living standard of our people, address long-standing internal conflicts, and diversify uh, foreign relations. We need to invest in human capital for equitable and inclusive growth and sustainable development and embrace inclusiveness and diversity to strengthen social cohesion during democratization process and beyond. Because we have many different ethnic groups, it is important for us to create a harmonious society to release the internal political and social tensions. 
low level of socioeconomic development can be destabilizing and compounding the existing conflicts. Fortunately, Myanmar is endowed with rich natural resources, abundant land, water, minerals, and energy resources, a youthful population, and the strategic location between People Republic of China and India, and additionally, access to ASEAN market. Rich agricultural resources combined with favorable climate underpin enormous growth potential and could provide us with the mechanisms for poverty alleviation. What we lack is strong institutional foundations and the capacity currently to nurture these foundations to enact meaningful policy that can transform the lives of our all citizens, including those left outside. We could go through high growth period through transitioning to an open market economy and have promising potentials of becoming one of the rising stars in the region, provided that we can strategically leverage above mentioned strong points that we possess. There will be a broad range of new economic and investment opportunities if we could diversify our economy into a range of business activities, tourism, financial sector, manufacturing, trading, and infrastructure, to name a few. For example, as the neighboring countries are moving up the global value chain, with escalating wages, Myanmar can attract manufacturing firms to relocate into the country. On the other side of coin, we must be aware of our own constraints limiting our progress. We can't effort to be complacent with all these potentials since we are having challenges like resolving armed conflicts and Rakhine issues and building democratic and federal union on the political front. On the Rakhine issue, I would like to first thank the Myanmar Economic Forum to first conducting a thoughtful dialogue held in Yangon last year, which was moderated by Myanmar citizen and included a cross-section of distinguished panelists of Myanmar citizens discussing economic costs of Rakhine. It is long way before we can have the strength to have candid discussions amongst ourselves in Myanmar in the open atmosphere. But I want to tell all of you here at the FCCT that the process has started and you may not hear about it in the news. Ordinary people recognize the horrors of what happened that unfortunately they have no control over the, 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 the incidents, but one day, Along with millions of Myanmar citizens, I believe we should live within the generally accepted principles of ASEAN migration policy. Furthermore, I want to share with you what I shared with D Danish. Myanmar citizens, like countless people over the world, have traveled to distant lands in search of a better life for themselves and their children. Even when they are poor, are accepted by the warmth of people from other host countries. And after they study and or work hard, and they live better lives and contribute back to the societies of their, their host countries. I believe one day, Myanmar can do the same for migrants who have come to our country or lived with us for generations. We must look to the future with the same care and compassion that our children and citizens receive when they have traveled overseas. On the economic front, we have concerns over a weak macroeconomic management framework with imperfect market mechanisms, deficient infrastructure with limited in industrial diversification, inadequate fiscal resources with limited access to finance and deprived social services that hamper human capital development, to name a few. The agricultural sector becomes vulnerable with frequent natural disasters. And there is the tendency for environmental degradation with climate change. 
Additionally, we have weak resources for governance with a fragile rule of law. It is the time for us to strategically plan our economic transition by investing in human capital and efficient infrastructure, creating strong institutions, and the use of market mechanism to effectively allocate resources. I personally believe that seeking for regional economic integration and environmental sustainability will lead us to healthy and sustainable development. Most importantly, we need to craft the key development agenda, which should include particularly a stable macroeconomic and enabling business environment for the private sector development and a sustainable fiscal position for the government. We need to improve the key areas of education, health, and infrastructure for human capital development and connectivity between person to person and institution to institution. We need to strengthen government institutions to improve state capacity to govern effectively and support economic transformation rather than focusing on the role of the government's ownership and control of economic activities. That is why we need a comprehensive state-owned enterprises reform to stimulate fair competition and a level playing field among private enterprises. On the administrative front, we need to go for administrative and regulatory reforms for efficient and effective government system. In conclusion, Myanmar's potentials will continue to be undermined until and unless we can overcome many complex and deeply rooted issues. To me, it is clear that equitable and inclusive growth is the most effective tool for reducing poverty, resolving conflicts, and installing social harmony in our young democratic society. I also ask you for your help in engaging with us and guiding us to help achieve this vision. Thanks to all of you for your attention. Ted, Ted could I just follow up on that and just ask your, for your view on how the NLD government has performed in creating a, an attractive climate for investment and addressing the very issues that you've raised there? I mean, how well do you rate your own government? Uh -huh. Uh, we, we, we were under, is, uh, under isolation for 50, more than 50 years, and uh, since 2011, the, the World Bank, IMF, ADB, the development partners came into our country, and then we are having the technical assistance from World Bank, IMF, and all the development partners, and then we have the team uh, focusing to increase the the ranking, the, the World Bank ease of doing ranking. Mm -hmm. And so far, unfortunately, uh, we have been ranking 171 out of uh, more than 190 countries around the world. And then... and then do, do you feel that's a failure of government or do you think that's just a reflection of the, the difficult position Myanmar was in when this help first arrived? Uh, actually, I, uh, to me, it's it's our our government. I, I think it's we, we need the balance and forward-looking leadership, and and then the, our government uh, put uh, more emphasis on the political matter than the economic and business matter. That that is the, the, the what is. The, you the don't happening. feel it's a pro-business government? No, the, uh, not pro-business government. I even think that we are having leadership vacuum over. Uh, economic and <coughs> business matter, and and then this is the, the situation. And then I I do I do ag agree with democracy in action, and then uh, the, our government doesn't have prior experience in executive positions, and then and they will have to learn along the way, and then now is the situation like uh, we are stuck somewhere in our. Uh, in, in, in our business do, sector. Do they listen to you when you, when you raise these concerns? Because I mean, you, they're your party. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> Are you going to be diplomatic? Uh, di different people <laughs> listen differently. And then, and, and, then <laughs> and, 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 and then what I should say is we should have the proper, proper kind of communication mechanism and listening mechanism, hearing mechanism, and then 
Uh, and we, we, I, I totally agree that we need to listen, our government need to listen more uh, to the private sector, to the civil society, yeah. and to, to the international... Do they know that, it, it, When it, you know it, but do they know it? Uh, some of them do, perhaps. I, I, it's some will definitely yeah. know, but it, 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 we, we cannot move that much yet. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you're, you're in the corporate sector. You've got to deal with the, the landscape the government lays out for you. What's your own view as somebody who actually has to turn a profit in Myanmar right now? Uh, yes, um, I think uh, in the moving forward, because uh, the, our new government, the, the democratic government, Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, win since last three years ago. So I think they had uh, a lot of ex experience and exposure within these three years. And uh, they trust um, business society than before, and I'm. I'm so they didn't use. You found they didn't trust you when they first took office. Um, because when they when they win the election, and and most of the they they view as a business society as a mo most of the business are crony kind of a business. So, they but thought all the business was tied to the old military yes, government. Yes, yes. But actually, business society need to be need to have a I mean network with any government. It doesn't mean that all the business are crony, but uh, need to have a, a connection as well as need to have a distance to move forward. So now I believe that in the future we hope the positive, I mean outlook. I mean, is it you yeah. cronies? Are, I mean, it's, I always feel it's a little unfair on Myanmar because we have this term um, cronies, but in fact, all over Southeast Asia, there are big, powerful, unaccountable, well connected businesses who tend to dominate. It's not that different. But I mean, you know, you're not a crony. I mean, how do you find doing business when you don't have those incredible connections at the top? So it is quite a challenge for us uh, because, uh, but we, we choose to, I mean, do the business ethically. So maybe uh, uh, it is quite a challenge for us, like, you know, because tender business or a lot of uh, government project, maybe maybe we might not win it. Uh, but but in the long run, when the sanctions suspended, uh, when the General Motor came in, you know, they, they checked the, I mean, company background, you know, due diligence, and then, a lot of the multinational company wants to work with the, the I mean, clear company. Like so, so we got a distributorship from the multinational company. Although maybe we will not win a lot of uh, other projects. So w was that difficult when you got the distributorship for Chevrolet? Yes. Wh yes. Why was it difficult? Uh, because a lot of a uh, company try to compete the the distributorship, and then after due diligence, a lot of company cannot compete anymore. Right, it so wouldn't meet the, the, yes. the General Motors standards. Yes. Yeah. Um, Kay, perhaps I could bring you in. Um, there is no economy without banking. Um, your own assessment of the banking sector now, I mean, is, is it, d does Myanmar have a normal banking sector now if you take the rest of Southeast Asia as a standard? Uh, okay, so Myanmar banking, are it is uh, like, uh, you know, in the before it is 2012, it is very traditional banking. Uh, we just accept the deposit and lending only. Lending also, it is uh, we rely mostly on the collateral base instead of looking into the credit worthiness and what is their repayment capacity. So this is uh, where we used to be for a nearly over uh, over decade. So uh, just recently in the 2012, after the new uh, democratic uh, it is a government elected, they tried to they realize that it is a banking certain need to change. So since the last two years, but we have a series of banking sector reforming in Myanmar, uh, especially on the, you know, when uh, we don't touch on the basic guideline. Now is that they have touched to the basic guideline, like, uh, you know, all the bank has to be the, what is the minimum uh, prudential guideline we need to meet, like uh, what is capital ratio, liquidity reserve, all those prudential guidelines has been out. So at this time, it is uh, what uh, banking industry is previously is, we are used to with the very traditional, very old method. And even though we have uh, some guideline, those doesn't meet with the international standard. So uh, in the uh, market in Myanmar is what happened is the customer are not used to with the, those guidelines. So you will hear that, you know, there is a very limited assessing the capital from uh, credit from the bank. 
And then another thing is uh, because of the like uh, in Myanmar, only the 10, I think it's a 10 to 15 percent are currently banking system in Myanmar. So nine, around 85 percent are not and banking with Myanmar yeah. because of the 2003 banking crisis. So at that time, people doesn't have belief in the banking industry because they have experience of the bank run in 2003. So now it is uh, all the bank in Myanmar are trying to get the trust from the uh, public and then we are making the, what is the banking role in the economy in Myanmar. So at that time, the central bank is try, trying to impose from the, you know, uh, it is uh, some of the prudential guideline that we are still having uh, challenges because they have issue of the prudential guideline. Those guidelines These have are the, the guidelines for sort of professional banking, I guess. Uh, yes, a kind of hybrid of the Basel two, not Basel two yet. This is kind of uh, like a hybrid now, yeah. uh, not on the Basel one, not to the Basel two guideline. So those when we impose it, this is very challenging on the market. It is because of the our corporate customer and the, our SME customer. Because Myanmar customer, uh, you know, they are not you familiar with the uh, to keep proper uh, how to prepare for the, their financial statement, order report, yeah. and then also for the corporate governance. So those kind of things. So is are, are you finding that that um, you know, lending money in Myanmar is just very high risk because people are not accustomed to managing debt? Uh, but uh, actually, it is a risk state has it. Risk state has it, but uh, it uh, not highly risk. It will be the moderate risk because people are very familiar with the collateral lending. Because uh, every most of the people in Myanmar, they feel that if they have a collateral, they can get loan from the bank. Now, is we change for the lending uh, credit policy, it's not about for the collateral. It is about for the how is your capacity to for the you know credit lending. So this is moderate, but we are uh, trying to educate to the, you know, our environment and also to the society as well. How is the banking system and the how it has been reformed and changed. So now is uh, most of the corporate customer in Myanmar and not only the corporate SME customer and also the customer in Myanmar, they start realize for that they have to change their bank, uh, their book and also to be the very transparent for the auditor report. This is essential for their company. This is the how, what's your own assessment of your government's um, uh, treatment of the banking sector? Actually, it is uh, for the banking sector. It is. I feel that this is uh, too many players in the you know banking industry. Currently, our local bank is 32 local bank who wow. got the license. <laughs> then also, it is uh, foreign branch is uh, now is uh, they are going to give the another two or three more. It will be total around 15. Yeah. So. Banking uh, industry is, I think, a lot of player in the market. And not all that viable, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, it's for the government side. What happened it is uh, they don't have uh, like uh, what is the uh, financial roadmap of the our banking industry to be, what they want to be. So now it is uh, all the player in the, okay, what is the cover our government move in the next 2020 or 2025? Uh, whether they were allowed the more foreign branch or uh, maybe full license or why is we still don't know yet? Kinkin, I, I, I wonder if you could perhaps give me your own view on what you think the priorities of the NLD government should be now. I mean, the, the, it's such a complex challenge lifting an economy that was isolated for so long and it's clearly been very difficult in these first um, seven years of, of reform. If you were to start now in the year 2019, what do you think are the most urgent areas that the government needs to work on to give the economy greater potential? Uh, I, I think that the way our government is doing, the, the pushing the, the banking sector for reform is quite aggressive. Uh, we need to, to be, uh, we, we need to be more strategic and then we need to be, we need to have the master plan for mm. banking sector reform. And then we, we have, we must have the roadmap so that the, the, the bank, banks and then the corporate sector itself, they, we can comply. It, it sounds like you think they're too aggressive. Too aggressive. As in what, they, they're moving too fast. Yes, because, because our government, I think, uh, we, we issue the Central Bank of Myanmar, uh, they, they issue uh, four regulations, which is for the, the, the capital, ad, ad, double the capital adequacy mm. ratio, and then now very strict on non-performing loan, 
and then for the large exposure, the related party transaction and all that, which is very right, but what I mean is uh, we, we, we should be gradual and incremental so that the, 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 the private sector as well as the banking sector can comply and then the, the reform will be successful. Because our government is very brand new government and then they are very ambitious about what is what, what is how, how, how the, the healthy banking sector looks like. And then we want to reach this one. Actually, we must have the, the roadmap three years after three years or maybe five years after five years because the, the private banking sector came into existence uh, 25 years ago. And then we only have uh, one product, which is overdraft, and uh, we have to renew the, the loan every every on every year basis. Every year basis, we don't have amortization plan, and we are just uh, the, the the private sector are supposed to uh, to 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 serve sur service the loan. That's it, and then no repayment plan and all that because it is on collateral-based lending. And then once you have the property, you can put your property in it as the collateral in bank, and you can draw out the money. And then the bank doesn't care about uh, the bank doesn't care about repayment plan and all that. Uh, no amortization plan. How do the banks so make a profit if, they, if they're running this way? No, <laughs> I, the, I mean, the maybe the you could ask you, Kate. Do they make a profit? Uh, uh, current, uh, previously it is uh, mostly uh, which uh, we don't have a fee base in Kent, only the remittance and spread only. Spread it is uh, in Myanmar is fixed region. Interest rate is uh, uh, eight percent is deposit, thirteen percent is lending. So this spread is around maybe three percent. Right. Is, yeah. is that, I mean I'm no expert, but is that is that not wide enough? Uh, yes, internationally it is a five percent and yeah. above. Yeah, in Myanmar, it's pretty quite low. That's why it is uh, what we are asking to the, our central bank of Myanmar and also to the government. What mm -hmm. is their uh, you know plan for the bank? So it is a banking sector because profitability is uh, one of the you know sustainability of the bank. Without profit, we can because currently our profit margin is very thin. Um, Kinkin, the, 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 what about opening to investment? I mean, the government's trying to open up Myanmar. It's, it's eased um, investment rules quite a lot, companies' rules, you know, the ability to, to have shares of Myanmar companies. Um, I mean, do you think that's going in the right direction? Uh, yes, I, in terms of company law, because we, we used to have uh, the company law which was enacted in 1914, which is over 100 year old since British, British colony. Assume, yeah. Yeah. Yes, and we like uh, a lot of your uh, finest th 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 is quite the, the company law is quite uh, progressive, and then we have uh, we we have online registration and all that, and it's the the, the pr progress we can see. I mean, I've heard but people it, say it's one of the easiest places in yes. in Asia actually to start uh -huh. a company. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. In, in, the, in the, this matter, oh, what what I, I want to continue is yeah. like. Uh, be because uh, bus uh, from the business sector, that the banks are ha having very thin margin for them. Mm -hmm. At the same time, for the business sector, because we only have one year loan, and then, and then long term or medium term projects are financed with a short term loan, which is kind of quite mismatch. Yeah. And then, and, and and then now our government wants to uh, uh, transform that the overdraft to the term loan, and then they they want they want. They want three years term loan, a uh, five years term loan, something like this, and with the amortization plan. Actually, uh, the, the business is, is supposing like I have uh, this business, I, I have this property, I, I put collateral in the bank, and then I draw money and I start up the business. And then once I have some extra money, I buy another piece of land, and then I put collateral in the bank, and then I draw money. And, and then I, I, I expand my business. And then a lot of people have, uh, are having the, the real estates, many real estates, at the same time very high, uh, high, very high debt, something like this situation. We it's need quite to risky, fix. you're gonna have people very, getting Very risky, yeah. and we need to we need Because there is something of a property bubble, isn't there? Yes, so yes, yeah. yes. I, I, was, I would say the property bubble bust already in 2016, mm -hmm. because we don't have the, the, the the, the proper statistics and all that, the government is not aware of that, but that the whole market knows that, mm. that, that the bubble bust already. So, 
Uh, one, of the, the, one of the things that the NLD government has also been really encouraging is opening up um, to foreign businesses, making it much easier for them. You're a local business. Does that work for you, having all this foreign competition coming in? Um, yes, uh, government opened up uh, a lot of uh, industry like trading, finance, banking. And also they need to encourage the manufacturing and value added production because as you knew, the, the biggest foreign direct investment is the extraction of the natural resource. And I mean, all of the country requirements need to import. So in balance of trade and then um, Myanmar is suffering a lot of budget deficit. So government need to think the sustainable, I mean, business development. So they have to encourage the manufacturing. But at the moment, like I set up a pharmaceutical manufacturing plan, but the tax to import the raw material is even higher than to import the finished products. So government need to fix that kind of uh, tax issues to favor the manufacturing so that, you know, um, Myanmar will get a lot of technical know-how. I mean, creation of job and, um, you know, training and will get the best practice. So government need to think about um, value-added production. Otherwise, e exporting the natural resource, import all the requirements will not go for our country. Look, I'll take a pause here for a moment. Um, if any of you would like to be brought into this, I, perhaps we could take a couple of questions at this stage, because there may be some other subjects that some of you want to ask about. Um, I will give you a few seconds to think about it. If anybody's got a burning question, let's take questions not from me, but from the floor. Jeff, and perhaps identify yourself too, please, for the panel. Uh, Jeffrey Goddard, club member and former resident of Myanmar for 13 years. Um, I have a question about protectionism. Um, I understand why you need foreign investment and I think it's a good thing depending where it's going. But I'm also aware that in some sectors of the business community in uh, Myanmar, there's fierce resistance to foreign com competition. And I cite the example of the... Um, liquor industry. Um, what can you do about, about this protectionist sentiment that is preventing foreign companies from investing in your country? So I don't know who would like to take that on. Perhaps we could start with you, Kinken, as you're <laughs> kind of wearing at least a parliamentary hat. Is there too much protectionism? Um, uh, it's, it, yes, we do have the protectionism mindset in our private sector, local private sector, because uh, they is that, that, that is all about, I think, uh, is how the, the business strategy. Uh, whenever the foreign companies come, uh, we, we, we are thinking just of, uh, oh, they are the competitor. We are, we are supposed to compete with them. Actually, rather than compete with the, 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 the foreign investors, uh, we, we should think uh, that the local business people think that how we can collaborate each other. Supposing like, uh, I, I'm not very familiar with the Leica company and all that, but for manufacturing, uh, we have now the, the C CMP, contract manufacturing practices for, for the garment, shoes, bags, handbags and all that. And then uh, we, we can start from CMP and we, uh, we receive order from our, our, our customers and then we, we make for them and then we ship, ship it out. And then, uh, rather than this, we have to climb up. We have to climb up ourselves, like our original equipment manufacturing to original design manufacturing, and then to original brand manufacturing, so that we will have local brand in in in, in ten years down the road or fifteen years down the road. Something like this kind of business strategy we need to educate to our local people. And local people, because we have very stringent business environment, yet the, the foreign investors are competing with us, and then we will not survive. And then the government has to address for the SMEs development and all that in order to uh, eliminate, uh, minimize the protectionist uh, kind of mindset, because they are very real. They are very real. They suffer a lot because of the very constraint the very stringent business environment, yet they are still need to compete with the, the, the foreign investors and then they will lose out definitely. That is why it's all about the business strategy. Uh, how are, are we going to uh, 
uh, collaborate with the for foreign investors and then how are we going to uh, scale up ourselves from original equipment manufacturing to to, to original design or original brand manufacturing so that Does we have to... Does the government have a strategy right now? I mean, do, do you get a sense the government is getting it right? Are, are they the balance between supporting local industry but also encouraging constructive foreign investment that might help them? Is mm -hmm. the balance right? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see the balance yet. I, I think government is quite naive in terms of business private sector development and, and then and then our uh, we, we, we just... Uh, uh, that uh, form up the, the Ministry of Invest, Investment and Foreign Economic Relations, and which is uh, uh, good, good, good sign that the government is committed to attract the foreign investor, that the investor, regardless of uh, local or the foreign. But at the same time, the, our SME, we, 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 do, we, we just had our, our SME law and regulations in last administration it's very and, and then we still need to implement uh, the SME development agency so that, uh, that the SME will have technical assistance access to market access to finance and all that and 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 kind of skill labor uh, something like this kind of t uh, the, the, the technical education uh, vocation and educational training something like this and then we have we have a lot of things to do in, in every front, and so uh, the government need to prioritize and sequence, and then the prioritize, the, the first priority should be the banking sector. The way they, they, ref they want to reform the banking mm -hmm. sector is too aggressive, and they have to come up with the relax and the relax kind of the, the roadmap. And the second, the urgent need is the government need to engage with the, 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 the EU, EU community because the EU is discussing about withdrawing GSP yeah. and all that because in, in, in NLD government, NLD government uh, we, we, the, the, the government sector, the, the, the contract manufacturing practice and all that are prosper. A lot of people are getting uh, jobs because of all these government sector. And, and then if, we, if the EU lifted, uh, e EU, EU put uh, lifted the GSP, and, and then and then we cannot be competitive. And then the, maybe the manufacturing sector they they try to withdraw. They relocate. They will relocate to Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, and all that. So this is one end. It's very urgent, very urgent. And then the second thing on the medium term, we should be doing the sm a small and medium enterprise SME development agency, and then we should be helping the, 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 the private sector effectively. John, John I mean, as, as somebody involved in promoting U.S. commerce, I mean, how do you find the issue of protectionism in Myanmar? Yeah, I think, um, you know, to address the question about is, uh, is foreign investment a threat to, to Myanmar companies? Uh, you know, I would submit that uh, what U.S. companies uh, bring to the market are best practices, they create jobs, they develop talent, uh, so it's um, it's really not uh, a threat in any way, but uh, it should help build the economy uh, and thrive in the long run. Is that what you find, Saul? That I mean, you're you're running a company. Do you find foreign competition a threat? Um, now they not anymore because uh, with the new government, they open all the foreign investment, and then right now what Myanmar people think is like you know if foreign investor and Myanmar investor, you know. I mean, compete each other. I mean, the winner will be the foreign investor because government really, I mean, emphasize more on the foreign investment. So I think- You feel they're not looking after you. <laughs> yes, and then not a protectionist anymore, I, I believe, yeah. Let's have the next question, please. <laughs> yeah, uh, Chris Bruton, a member of the club. I'd like to ask, uh, since we have three wonderfully flexible ladies in our panel, uh, I'd like to ask the question, what would you, how would you evaluate the Bama character, personality? Um, I ask that because I, I've lived here in Thailand for over 50 years and I visited Myanmar for about 25 years. And what I've noticed is that, well, for example, a friend of mine who invested in Thailand, he, he met with a minister here, and after explaining his project, the minister said, well, no, you can't do that. And then he said, but why not? 
And then the minister said, well, in Thailand, the more we say no, the more we mean yes. Uh, but a friend of mine from Myanmar actually said to me some years ago, well, you know, in Burma, uh, which it then was, uh, the more we say yes, the more we mean no. And, and I get the impression that, you know, there's a lot of intransigence in the market. I, I've, in my time, met up with Presidents Nay Win and So Maung and Tan Shui. And you have not, not mixed with nice company. <laughs> and <laughs> not as yet Aung San Suu Kyi, but she seemed to be the most intransigent of all. She beat uh, even Theresa May, I think, in terms of stubbornness. So uh, I wonder if you could tell us, you know, each of you, what you think... Do you Burmese think there is, I mean, you're like. suggesting there is a, a national character. I'm wondering, yes, and, and how would you define it? Because it does seem that, you know, Thailand has not the same quality of resources as Myanmar does, uh, well, and yet uh, we're so far ahead, and, and you could be so far yes, ahead I'm of I'm us. I'm not sure if you'll get the answer you want there. I suppose where the question is, is there a Burma ca characteristic way of doing business? Yeah, I think he is absolutely right because Myanmar was in the military government for so long time. So Myanmar people used to, I mean, y Myanmar people used to with the, I mean, like a one direction. We you need to, I mean, obey and follow. So you dare not to say no, although you you think that it cannot be possible, but you have to say yes. So very used to with the yes, but actually. At the end of the day, the result come out is uh, another scenario. So just say yes, and then later on, you have to follow up. It's the culture. The Myanmar culture, we need to amend. Uh, because it, it's the mindset. The, we, we need mindset revolution. Because we have to redefine the role of the government. The government as the regulator, they should facilitate rather than control. And then the mindset is because we are the regulator, we must be in control. And then this, that, that is the mindset with our government. It's kind of national character. We need to uh, amend. And then and the Myanmar people is in general, not only the government. And we don't know how to read in between the lines. That is the problem. And this is the education system that we need, we need to promote the critical thinking and debate, argument, and all that, this kind of uh, the, the culture we need in, in our uh, young days. And, and, then, and then it's very fortunate that we, we, are, we are the member of ASEAN and then our senior uh, office officers, uh, senior officials, government, the leader are engaging with the ASEAN community. The way they, they practice is kind of the participatory and consultative decision making process. And then, and then we are changing slowly and we are learning from ASEAN way of thinking, ASEAN way of doing uh, the, 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 the stuff. So that is why we need exposure. Our people need exposure, the, the government, the, the ordinary citizens. We need exposure how the other people are uh, working their work, uh, do, doing something like this. That is why I want to seek uh, the, the, the international community to engage with Myanmar so, so that our people will learn along the way. It's the most positive assessment of the ASEAN way I think I've ever heard. <laughs> Kay, what about your own view about, about my business culture? Yeah, um, so from, from my view, it is the same like, you know, what the Ma says, sister says. Actually, it is uh, what happened. It is uh, doing uh, how we nurture up from the parent. It is uh, whatever they say, we can't, you know, uh, talk back to them. Okay. No matter how we like or dislike it, we just keep quiet. This is the nature in happening. Even like uh, in the working environment nowadays, what happens is uh, like a young generation, whatever we extend, you know, what is their complaint? Even the complaint is good things for a company and as well as for their improvement. They feel shy to talk their complaint. So I think quite a few countries would recognize that. Andrew, <laughs> can I have your question, please? Andrew Patrick, uh, former British diplomat in, in Yangon. Um, the panel have talked about one of the challenges being the state of, of Myanmar's infrastructure. You have some pretty significant offers from China to improve that infrastructure. Uh, what does the panel think the government of Myanmar should do about those offers? <laughs> Beware of Chinese bearing gifts. <laughs> King Kim, they're going to ask you first. Yeah. First and foremost, actually, we should diversify foreign relations. And then we should diversify in... 
the economic relations, not only with China, uh, because China is huge, very rich now, and then very influential, very powerful. And then we also, because we are in between China and India, we have to build up our self, stand up ourselves, and st strong enough uh, to to survive. And then, th and then we cannot rely solely on one particular country, uh, or, or whatever the country is. So we need diversification in foreign relations, foreign economic relations. And that is why our government, what mm. our government should do is the private, uh, sorry, public, uh, public procurement reform. Because we have very high corruption, so if we, can, we could do uh, a public procurement reform, and then we have some resistance with us, and then we can cooperate with other, 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 other countries. Uh, what do you think, though, specifically, China? you know, China's involvement in big projects like Chaopu? I mean, no other government or country would invest the way that China has there. It's almost mm -hmm. a unique offer. Is that a positive or a negative for Myanmar? Actually, actually, uh, because we used to be under uh, the, the West, the U.S. sanction, EU sanction, and we don't have any choice but to make friends with China. This is the situation. Uh, we, we have to deal with, and that is why uh, it, it, we, we end up with China. That, that is why we need to diversify, and then that international community has, has to understand uh, how Myanmar is struggling out of internal political, social conflicts and all that, and democratization process. And, and it's very demanding period for us, and then we need understanding and help and uh, the, the engagement from the international community. So China involved, I mean obviously there are a lot of Chinese companies operating in Myanmar as well. Does that uh, affect you? Uh, yes, because uh, we are neighbors, so uh, a lot of uh, border trade from China and then nowadays, China, China, previously China product quality are, I mean, quite low. Uh, but nowadays, you know, the, the Chinese product quality become uh, quite good mm -hmm. and prices quite competitive. So, like, uh, we distribute multinational brands, but the uh, price are quite expensive. So, Myanmar people are poor and, and we are the least developing country. So, nowadays, acceptance of the Chinese products are, are more and more in, in Myanmar. So, are there yeah, any Chinese competitors for your business? Chinese competitor? Yeah, yeah something like a, a diagnostics area, like uh, because we distribute the raw diagnostics uh, uh, reagents and, and instruments, but uh, from China, a lot of uh, similar diagnostic with a very, very reasonable price. So uh, a lot of competition, yes. Mm. And we're going to ask you, John, a bit of unfair <laughs> <laughs> on that one. Michael, throw your question out. <coughs> Sorry, Michael Mackey, freelance. Can we just keep with the issue of infrastructure? Is there a problem um, within Myanmar that the issue of infrastructure isn't being dealt with? And is the problem that who is offering to pay for it? And it was very interesting that Andrew mentioned China, yet one of your neighbors was offering to pay for a connection from Dawe to the border and on to Bangkok. Um, is the problem who is offering to pay for it, or is the problem that the elite within Myanmar is interested in other things, that it just doesn't get the need for infrastructure because it sees what it is doing as a political project? Are you referring to Dawei in particular, or is that a, a, as a sort of example of a project you think might that be That was problem? just an example, but if, I mean, if, if people want to talk about Dawei, I won't stop them. I'm just trying to crystallize your question. So you're saying, that is, do, do they, does the panel see a problem with the source of the funding for the infrastructure? The sourcing of the source of the infrastructure funding, wherever it comes from. Because there, Dr. Tet, there was an mm. example of an offer to build infrastructure that was diversifying, but yeah. which whilst there's been a problem with it in Thailand because of who originally backed the idea here, there doesn't seem to have been much, much push from the Myanmar side. 
I suppose a, a broader question in that is, is of the infrastructure projects that are very, and there are a lot of very big infrastructure projects, mm -hmm. are they all, in your own view, appropriate? I mean, are they the right kind of infrastructure? Not, of course, because uh, supposing like new Yangon development project, mm. uh, it's the, 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 new, the, new the city, public outcry yeah. now. Public is outcrying now. The government doesn't listen, and then he is trying to, to proceed. Uh, is, that the big, is that the biggest sort of um, current, currently discussed the infrastructure tw 20, project? 20,000 acres, which is... It's huge. Yes, it's yeah. huge. It's kind, well, kind of... Is it four times the size of Singapore or something? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and then... That, this is that supposed is to why, be a new That Yangon, is why yeah. in terms mm. of... If we want to develop the infrastructure within our country uh, on pr proper, uh, proper way, and we have to go for the public procurement reform first. And, se and then uh, we, 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 we float the tender, mm. tender, and then th that tendering process must be, must be very competitive, very transparent, and very kind of... What, what's wrong with the procurement processes at the moment? So all government projects are not very transparent and then tendering process, no, t no proper tendering process and all that. And then it's kind of, uh, supposing like, uh, supposing like for uh, the, the China, China, the state-owned enterprises, they are very huge co conglomerates, and then they, they just go straight to the government, not even go to the pub but private sector like us. Mm -hmm. And we are very small for them. We are very small for them. They just go straight to the government and then they make the government happy and then the, the, the project is the, 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 the One of the first big infrastructure projects in Myanmar, when I first started going back there in, in 2012, was Tilawa, the, the industrial and port area. And that was funded uh, largely by Japan at the time. I mean, as a, as a model, is, has that been a good, good example? Yes, I, I totally agree with Tilawa model because... Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the president, Teng Seng, he, he paid a visit very fast to Japan, and then Japan government w uh, write off our loan, our mm. debt, so that we have to, Japan has been very good to us, very good friend for us, and then, and then at the time, uh, Myanmar hold the majority 51%, and then Jap Japanese hold 49%. Out of 51, Myanmar, uh, and then the government, Inv invest the land 10% and then another 41% that all the, the Myanmar private sector uh, we raise funding and then we invest and then gov the, the Japan side I think three cons three companies consortium they invest 49% which is very ethical and kind of the, the very 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 uh, very meaningful for us and you, you're saying the new Yangon city project is not like that no no, the, the public outcry, outcry in, in Yangon, and then the government doesn't care. But, but this is your government, NLD government, because I mean the, the Tilawa was under <laughs> then same government. Mm -hmm, Sorry mm -hmm. to say it's your government, because I know it's not, no, you're not I, I, in government. I, I want to be objective. Yeah. I want to be objective as Myanmar citizen. I'm not protecting, I, I'm not supposed to protect my own government or mm. my own party. I, I, I need to protect, address that the, 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 the state that the whole country, not only the party or the, the government. So the government can come, come, come and go with the election every year. So we have to uh, uh, take the national interest rather than party interest or government interest. It, it, it must be the national interest. That is why, even though Teng Seng administration is not my government, the way they did for Tilawa is acceptable. But now NYDC, New Yangon Development Co Company, uh, which is Yang Yangon, Yangon, the, the government is not that the way they, they they are doing is not acceptable by the public. Sounds a bit like the way they built Nepidor. <laughs> no comment. Nepidor has been, I think, uh, has been uh, since 2006. It means that 13 years already, mm. and then it's still quite deserted. And then, and then, and then the, the I, I doubt about purchasing power. Even the CCCC came and invest in this NYDC. This is a Chinese and then company. Who, yeah. who are they selling to? Mm. I I don't know who will be buying. 
who will be the buyers of their, their project? Their real estate, the, the development, maybe the industrial zone. We have, we have I think, more than one dozen industrial zone in, in Yangon region. And then we should upgrade the existing industrial zone rather than implementing not very feasible uh, uh, the mega project. And then we end up, we need to pay back to, the, to, to China and all that. It's not, it's not good for the, our people. Can I ask our other two panelists, uh, uh, business panelists, uh, about the infrastructure needs and, and your own view about what's, what's an urgent priority for, for infrastructure? Uh, like electricity, because uh, in order to uh, develop the manufacturing sector, uh, need a lot of electricity. Like, uh, you know, when I build my factory, you know, I have to invest all the wires, cables, you know, a transformer, all this by myself, rather than, I mean, getting, a, I mean, help from the government. So that's, that's create a lot of, I mean, high cost, so that, you know, it will suffer to our people, because as a business, we will charge on our product cost, right? So, mm. so yeah. It, it's not adequate yet. Yes. Yeah. Kate, do you have any views on that? For the infrastructure, it is for the banking sector because for us, this is long-term project. Uh, mostly what we need is uh, we need funding from the overseas. Uh, locally, we can support. This is definitely sure. That's why it is uh, in Myanmar, uh, I think it is the government is looking for the funding from the ADB or JIGER or somewhere where can get for the long-term. For what they have focusing it is uh, for the government, they should focus on the like uh, logistic and education. So for because in the uh, Myanmar we have uh, like a uh, talent is really issue for the every sector, not only our bank, our banking sector, also in the other industry also we have a uh, talent issue, skilled labor issue. You're not getting enough skilled labor. Uh, not really. Yeah. Because I mean, that's we don't a problem have here enough too, but vocational, it's uh, yeah. big vocational training school. Yeah. Is that something the U.S. can help with, John? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're, not, you're not into the big infrastructure projects like China. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, like I, I mentioned in my remarks, the, the big challenge is to just to draw some attention yeah. and pull in, uh, you know, new to market companies. So uh, across sectors, uh, size, SMEs, uh, yeah. Next question, please. Apologies, I have another question for Dr. Tet, <laughs> because there are so many questions around, you know, around that government. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to come back to Rakhine State, um, uh, because unfortunately that makes still headlines. Um, what's the plan of the government economically to develop the Rakhine State? Um, as far as I remember, a few months ago, um, Aung San Suu Kyi visited that area, and um, there must be some plans for that. There have been some works, but um, since then I haven't heard anything. And the second question related to that would be, um, if there are some plans, economic plans, do the Rohingyas who have fled the country, uh, is there any place for them? Is there any function for them? In there? Is, is there a plan, a holistic plan, politically and economically, in order to make a return, if there is, to make such a return um, meaningful. Yeah, I don't know whether that's something you can address, Ted. Ted actually, actually, uh, once our government swan in the office, uh, the do our state councillor uh, uh, tried to set up a co co committee, advisory committee, mm. chaired by Dr. Kofi Anna, mm. and Dr. Kofi Anna. It came up with the report with 88 recommendations. And then I think the government is uh, uh, trying to have these 88 recommendations as, as their ro roadmap, and then they are trying their best to, uh, to implement 88 recommendations. But the outcome, the, the, the problem is, actually we need, we need a legal framework for, for migration. Because we are, we are the, uh, we, we, we are ASEAN country, we have ASEAN framework, and in ASEAN, we are the sending country. Our Myanmar people go and work in Thailand, in Malaysia, in Singapore, in Philippines, and all that, in Vietnam, so that we are the sending country. And then all these countries, 
uh, other receiving country. And then uh, with the sending country and receiving country, we should have some agreements. Uh, uh, fortunately, we have ASEAN framework, uh, and then and then we need we need to address it administratively uh, for the, the 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 migration kind of. Uh, the, the, the policy we, we, we should have. But in the case of Rakhine, I mean, there is this, this now, a lot of, lot of economic development going on in Rakhine. Mm -hmm. From what you know of it, is there any consideration to bringing back the Rohingya Muslim population to take part in that? that our government is struggling this, and then they are, they are welcoming back, and then the people are not coming back. I mean, the, if you think about the conditions in which they fled, nobody imagines they it's feasible. I mean, a lot of their villages have been wiped out. I mean, literally, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they've been bulldozed. They're not there anymore. It's not, mm -hmm. not just they got burnt. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't seem, well, the government says it'll have them back, but nothing that we've seen suggests that on the ground there is any readiness to take them back. They, they mm -hmm, want them gone. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that your impression? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we should have the, 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 the specific plan for Rakhine, mm. Rakhine State. Is, look, the Rakhine mm -hmm. issue is always going to be there now because it's such a big story and it's mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it's, it's been such a shock for so many people. I mean, for all mm -hmm, of you, is mm -hmm. that does that does it in any way affect your own sense about bu business confidence in the country? I think this conflict area is not the uh, vast not do not represent the vast majority of the Myanmar citizens. So, I think uh, Myanmar is still. I mean, have a lot of potential because it is only represent a small minority area, and it is more on a border area. So, mm. uh, does it affect the, your your own? I mean, has it? Do you feel it's affected the business climate in the country? It's it's a conflict. It's not. A, uh, you're right. Economically, it's not that important. But just the huge attention that the world has given to this problem. Has, have you f all felt the effects of that? Uh, yes, yes, very much. Because uh, a lot of uh, big multinational <laughs> company now they 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 are thinking like maybe. Appoint an uh, agent or a uh, distributor, and then they, they, they may leave the country. Or they are thinking, like, how to, I mean, operate or maybe reduce the, the number of people or something like that. Yeah. Um, we got any more questions? Please, Rob. Thank you. Good, e Good evening. Uh, Robert Kinnear, Alternative Innovations. I'm a retired member of this club. Um, I'm an engineer of uh, various hats, and I've got uh, a question on the oil field side and also one on the water side, because I have worked considerably in both sections. I used to design oil wells and general manager of an oil company. There's not much being said about the oil activity in Burma anymore. Um, I am familiar with uh, the general geology of the world, including Burma, Myanmar, and uh, they do have, you do have some of the deepest, largest oil reservoirs, very similar to those of Venezuela. In fact, you're second after Venezuela in those particular reserves. Uh, nobody seems to be mentioning this at all. Uh, um, so I was wondering what your knowledge is of potential oil development. And Not sure. pertaining to that, <coughs> offshore, yes, certainly. Yeah. Um, and pertaining to that and the Reckon State, um, there were plans a number of years ago to developing that area for oil field purposes. And I'm just In wondering... In Rakhine you're talking about? Yes. And I'm wondering whether there's any correlation uh, <laughs> to oil field development and the movement of people for... Probably uh, not, because most of the development in Rakhine is around Chaupu, which is away from the conflict area, or yeah, has been conflict in the past. I suppose <laughs> the, the development has not <laughs> taken place yet in these um, deep reserves that I'm talking about, which you may yeah, not be I'm familiar not, with. I know we don't have any sort of experts on the extractive industries here. I mean, Rob's asking about whether, I think maybe Ted, you mind a little bit, about how, how much development there is at the moment of Myanmar's oil and gas reserves. Um, that I, uh, I don't have any idea. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the w actually, generally speaking, uh, we don't have technology. Mm. We don't have technology. We have to attract the foreign investors. The foreign investors, the, the, the oil and gas companies, mm. and, and all that. And, and so far, Petronas. Uh, hmm? Petronas. Total. 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 Yes, Teu. 
Chevron. Chevron. I mean, as far as far as I know, Rob, the in fact the the oil and gas investment has been some of the earliest, because it's it's straightforward and in, in terms of the the returns are fairly straightforward. I don't know how extensive it is and whether it, there could be more ex extracted. It's not very straightforward anymore because of modern technology and um, seismic uh, information. Sure. Uh, it's, uh, the, the technology of 1850 when uh, the first oil was extracted is, is uh, long, long since past. You're probably stretching all of our technological uh, te well, or technical I, I, knowledge. I could now. possibly inform you because I am very well informed on it, okay, but I won't we'll continue with questions. it. But uh, my other question then pertaining to water development and um, infrastructure and electricity, some of you will be familiar with my design, which is a uh, river catchment flood prevention system. And of course, um, uh, Myanmar recently, if correct me if I'm wrong, they cut back on China's investments in uh, large mega project dams. Um, One dam in particular. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. quite controversial. Uh, yeah. No, I... I happen to have um, a design which I would freely give to you um, <laughs> regarding, uh, it, it's called the River Catchment Flood Prevention System, which is a series of, uh, multiple series of uh, reservoirs offset from the river rather than damming. Um, I call it a megapixel mega project. Do, sorry, Rob, do you have a question that's relevant well, to the panel? Yes, I am. I have to describe the sit scenario so I can ask okay. the question, but um, if you'll just give me a moment. Um, this, is, this is actually a global requirement. There was flooding in, 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 um, um, in Burma, in Myanmar, and uh, this, this design would actually prevent the flooding, but it would also develop infrastructure and, uh, and provide electricity. So I'm wondering what um, your thoughts might be on taking on such a, or considering such a project? I think that's a bit, we've got, a, we've got somebody involved in banking, someone involved in pharmaceuticals and a parliamentarian on the banking committee. I think that's probably a, a bit too much for people. I mean, I, I think it's gone beyond us here. Um, well, the lady was uh, saying she had to put in her own electricity. I thought she might have some understanding about the electricity. Uh, I problem. think everyone in Myanmar has an understanding and about the difficulties of, of getting and electricity and because it's not available. Everybody has a problem with, with the flooding, so I thought everybody might have mm. an opinion on that. I, 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 to be honest, I, I don't quite see that's a question anybody here could answer. Jeff. Um, question for Tete Khan okay. about electricity and infrastructure. <laughs> Should your government approve the Mitsone Dam? Uh huh. Actually, I don't have enough information uh, I, because we are waiting for the decision from the, the higher level government that the whole country is waiting because the, the, the contract and all that, the transparency is not there. We don't know how the contract is like and we don't know, it's very technical. And we, we need technical information, and then the, the, uh, the, the, the whole country is waiting for the government, what, what the government will decide. Well, I know she dropped it hint recently, but she might say yes. Is it's the probability, uh, yes. But isn't it in the end very political, Jeff? I mean, obviously there were a lot of sensitivities about Chinese influence and investment, and that kind of crystallised it. It was very emotional. People yeah. People saying you're already sold the nation. How can they ban it? Sure. So um, it wouldn't be banned. It would be banned if it was banned. Um, so I think it's a very big political risk for your government mm -hmm. to approve that dam, mm -hmm. given how united the country was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There will also be the movement against <coughs> Misong Dam. Mm. Yes, yes, in to defeat. Yes, it's starting. And it's the legacy problem. <laughs> Could you give an indication as to what is the feeling among NLD MPs? The feeling. The feeling. Among NLD MPs about the Misong Dam. Uh, the, the feeling is. Like uh, the, 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 the state councillor will say yes. This is my feeling, maybe right or wrong. We have to wait and see. And is this feeling causing disappointment or happiness? 
<laughs> it will. It is. It, it will be disappointing for majority of Myanmar people. Can I? I just wanted to broaden something out to the panel, which is, you know, you're all involved in in different sections of business. How have you felt in business it, it, in terms of the expectations of ordinary people in Myanmar? You know, you've got this business, which is about making money and looking for opportunities. And then there's politics. And politics is about selling, aspirate, telling people what you can do for them. And, you know, when Myanmar opened up, the expectations of people were huge. And inevitably, we're in a period now where there is more disappointment and where the politicians have to answer people about being unable to do things. How much does that concern you now that we're in this period where for politicians, there's both business and there's politics, and sometimes they conflict. Does it make it difficult for you? Does it make you worried about how the government will manage, manage the economy when it has so many political expectations it has to meet? Yeah, but, uh, I think uh, because now the election is quite near and, and it will be in 2020, and then I think they will prioritize, and they, I think they, already got uh, some experience like uh, slowing down the business mm -hmm. I mean compared to the previous government things in government so they realize that they have to emphasize p business the same as the peace because when they became in power they, they more emphasize on peace but now they, they change the trend so yeah you'd expect them to start really focusing on yes. on reviving the economy in yes. these last uh, year well, it's a uh, year and a half before the election. Yes. But does that, I mean, would, do you think they'll do it in the right way? I mean, because sometimes people do short fixes just to try and get it to win an election. Yeah, so they, they fix uh, a lot of things in the short term. Mm. And also this, this will also benefit for the long term, like a financial sector mm. opening up. So I think it will be okay. Kay, do you find that, that it, you know, you've, you're very concerned with the fairly arcane business of the banking sector. Most ordinary people don't understand that. They don't doesn't make any sense to them. Um, uh, reform, uh, reforming of the banking sector is, uh, we see this is quite positive for the future of economy of Myanmar. This is what, because like a financial sector need to be strong and healthy. Mm -hmm. So if other, as for a government, what we expect from them, it is uh, like a uh, stability. Mm -hmm. uh, because like uh, it is a financial sector is dealing with the, a lot of international as well as like a lot of correspondence from the banks uh, from the like other s uh, counterparty. So at this time it is that uh, if the, our government is not stable, uh, we can't do any uh, transition with them. They can start immediately. Yeah. So that's just the, what they can be impact. That's why it is uh, what we expect from the, our government. They should have for some stability in the, our country. Can I ask all three of you, uh, are you disappointed with the engagement of the foreign investment community since all of those promises. I remember when President Obama arrived in late 2012, you know, everyone was saying, oh, Myanmar, it's the new frontier. It's a sort of golden opportunity. And a lot of those companies that were coming in to explore never put any money in at all. Um, I, I mean, are you disappointed, all three of you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, that's why our, we end up with the China, China and, and India. <laughs> is it, do you think that they, 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 sh they should have tried harder, they didn't understand Myanmar, or do you think there were genuine reasons why they felt they couldn't commit more? Yes, <laughs> they, they have their own maybe genuine reason. Yeah. <laughs> Kinkin, I mean, your own view about that. I mean, you must have, you, you've, you've been dealing with f people who want to invest in Myanmar for a long time. Mm -hmm. You've met them, you know what their thinking is. Mm -hmm. Do you think in the end they were just too, you know, particularly Western investors were too cautious and, and too concerned yes, with the immediate profits. Yes, it's the reputational risk for, yeah. for the, uh, the Western companies to come into our country. And that is why this Rakhine issue is very, uh, it is the elephant in yeah. the room. That is the yeah. problem with us. But at the same time, uh, we, we have 54 million people, and then r the Northern Rakhine affairs is quite this small area, mm. so it's like Dr. Saw. I will, I will, I will tell that it's not Rakhine. 
issue, we do have Rakhine issue, but it's not representative of the whole country. We have mm. 54 million people. In Rakhine, I think at most is 1 million people. Mm. It's a few million, I think. Yeah, I can't well, the population is quite small. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kay, do you feel let down? Uh, for that, well, because I'm in the financial sector, I saw the inflow of the capital. So inflow of capital is mostly coming from Asia, not from the Western. Mm. But what the Western people expect it is uh, they like to see the what is the structure of the company mm -hmm. what is the corporate governance they like to see the what is the legal framework and all those things. yes <laughs> as we engage the government as we talk to the government as we talk to the business community uh, in Myanmar we we do sense that there there is disappointment that uh western and u.s investment did not come pouring in uh in the country um a lot of that has to do with, you know, U.S. Uh, businesses are, 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 you know, risk averse and uh, very, uh, you know, they're very careful. They make, they want to make informed investment decisions. So they're cautious. And uh, so uh, the investment did not come pouring in. So there, I think there was some disappointment. Um, that said, uh, you know, the narrative that, uh, you know, the West has given up on Myanmar is, is, not, is not accurate. Uh, you know, what we want to do is we want to highlight the, the investment that has taken place. Uh, you know, uh, in Myanmar, you know, Coca-Cola is bottling, uh, Colgate's making mouthwash mm -hmm. and toothpaste, Ford, uh, they're assembling vehicles. Um, you know, Ball Corporation was actually the first uh, resident company at the Tilawa uh, mm -hmm. SEZ. So there's, um, there, there is investment that took place and uh, of course, you know, we hope to attract more. Myanmar should attract more. How much and of a problem has the Rakhine issue been for, for example, U.S. investors? Has that put some of them off? Yeah, it, it has. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I didn't really, I wasn't familiar with the term reputational risk until I came to Myanmar. Mm -hmm. And then we heard, we, we heard a lot about it mm -hmm. uh, in, in the aftermath of the Rakhine crisis. Uh, but I, well, I will say this, and, and some companies did leave the market, but uh, those companies that did and spoke to me about their decision, it, it wasn't just Rakhine. You know, maybe that was the final straw, but they all referred to the ease of doing business. Some frustrations with market reforms, uh, promises for liberalization that didn't happen. So it's a whole package. Uh, the challenges of doing business in Myanmar have put some off. For all three of you, is, you've men all mentioned membership of ASEAN. You know, ASEAN now has an, ac an economic community that is liberalizing the trade in, in goods and s possibly eventually services. Is that a good thing or a bad thing for Myanmar? Okay. <laughs> A lot of challenge for our country. It will be a lot of challenge. So, uh, it is good, but there is a pros and cons. Uh, but for uh, our industry in Myanmar, mostly uh, all are in the we are in the infant stage only. So when the, like uh, ASEAN is open up, so there will be the our player uh, is uh, our people in Myanmar should prepare for that yeah. moment and to meet it. A lot of challenge. Yeah, Tet Tet, what, what about for you? For me, it's more pros than cons. So only if uh, we cannot cope with the situation, we will fail. But if we can cope with the situation, and then we will prosper to the next higher level. So yeah. competition is always good. Competition yeah. and coexistence. And we have to seek uh, for that the, the, the higher the, the corporate governance, yeah. whatever it is, the, the, the productivity and skill, leadership, whatever, the management and all that, all we have to upgrade ourselves. Otherwise, we will be complacent. And you think ASEAN can help with that? I or think be exposed to competition uh, from uh -huh, ASEAN? Uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh. And so, what about you? Because of the ASEAN Free Trade um, Agreement, uh, all the tariffs will be zero uh, when they export to Myanmar. So, so um, you know, uh, they don't have anchor. I mean, they don't have. I mean, they don't really want to set up a manufacturing or value-added production facility in in Myanmar. They just export. So it will create more budget deficit, mm -hmm. and it will be. I mean, a challenge for the local as well as. 
not necessarily local, any manufacturer in Myanmar uh, to compete with the ASEAN uh, product. I, I want to sort of probably wrap up, but finish on a sense from all of you. Um, if you have to speak to the international investment community in it, and, and, and encourage them to come to Myanmar, um, it's been an incredible few years. Uh, we've gone from soaring expectations to the terrible blur of Rakhine. It's been a, for foreigners who don't focus a lot on Myanmar, you know, they're, they're, I think they're very confused. Perceptions keep changing. You know, is this country the, the gr greatest opportunity? Is it going wrong? Is the military still in charge? Is it not? Is Aung San Suu Kyi a saint? Is she not? It's been very, very confusing for them. Um, perhaps I could start with you, Ted. Ted what, what would your message be to people who look at Myanmar as a possible investment opportunity? What would you tell them uh, to encourage Personally them? speaking, I believe in investment. Because uh, foreign investment, foreign, uh, once we receive foreign investment, we will have uh, employment generation, the foreign companies will, take, will pay taxes to, the, to our government, and then we will produce and we will export to, to the global market. And because supposing like Adidas or whatever kind of world-renowned brand, they, once they produce in our country, and then we can readily export to the world market because they have a well-established brand mm -hmm. and then capital inflow into the country, the technology transfer, the knowledge transfer, the skill development of our people. I, I see I, I, I see that the benefits of foreign direct investment rather than uh, seeing it's the, 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 the threats to us. And, and then uh, w when we see Singapore, Singapore has uh, uh, received a foreign direct investment 50 years uh, back, since 50 years back. Now we can see Singapore, how advanced it is. And then sometimes it's the passive risk. And at the same time, the government must have kind of domestic shield for the, uh, the, the, the small and medium enterprises to survive. And then uh, we have to attract foreign direct investment. At the same time, we have to uh, uh, support our S local SME so that it will be the balanced kind of development. And that is why for the country's development, in Myanmar, we, have, we do have a uh, Rakhine issue, but we have uh, 54 million people. We need social economic development in our country. That is why I want to seek the investment, the, the foreign investors to come and invest in our country. It will be the win-win situation for, for both parties. Okay, have you got something that could induce foreign investors to come? Uh, we are working for uh, FTI. Because uh, FTI it is, uh, because sometimes we can leverage their experience to the, you know, our market. As for example, like a uh, uh, central bank before they issue the license, uh, license to the foreign brand, we are asking the central bank how they will lay out for the, what is their plan for the, those foreign brands, how, how much they are going to allow to them to do the business in Myanmar. Be because like a foreign bank in, in Myanmar is very small, or the bank size, so we can leverage with them. We can do send funding to the credit lending to the our customer. Can, can foreign banks really help you in your sector? Uh, not really at mm. the moment because they are very. Uh, because you know it is that uh, their corporate governance, their compliance is very strict. That's why I say it's challenge for the our customer in Myanmar, especially like SME corporate. Every segment has such state challenge. You, you clearly can't see it as as possible for Myanmar to raise its banking standards to the same as those foreign investors anytime soon? Uh, maybe, nay, nah, maybe it may take time. Yeah. It may take time. But like a foreign government, they share how for the like a policy of the FTI very clearly, uh, whether they want the in kind or maybe in capital, how is their flow plan on that? Mm -hmm. Now is at the moment we can, because they allow FTI, but they don't have proper structure, what should be the FTI flow? Okay. So a message for, for would-be investors from you. Um, they should come to Myanmar because uh, cheap labor price com compared to the neighboring country and 54 million people and the strategic location uh, uh, be between the Indian and China. So they should definitely come uh, and, uh, and 
our government will do their best to improve in the future. So if they come now, they will get the first mover advantage. Still a golden opportunity. Yes. I'd like to thank all of our panelists and thank you all for coming as well and for all of your questions. Thank you.